So we build up, we start super basic, and then we add more and more modern defenses, and so we see how attackers have gotten around them. And we do, I structure it in three parts. Well, I may change that into my next semester, uh, but we do kind of network insecurity, I call it. So how do you sniff things on the network, how to control uh, intercept packets, how to inject in packets, how to play all kinds of cool. Do yes. And then the second part is binaries. So we look at binary security and application security. So that's a lot of operating systems and assembly language. Can you petition them to like put networks as a deficiency for grad in many Because like I never took it. <laughs> it's fighting them, but yeah, you should take that. I mean you can I go over it's a grad class, so I go over the stuff at the high level. Yeah. But if you don't know it, it's up to you to then go and learn it okay. at a deeper level. Question related to the class. On the one that you're around the boss right now, so like Yes. Give me an example. I don't remember. You can't give me the bad example. <laughs> I'm supposed to come up with one? What if I come up with one that's going to be on the exam? That would be great. <laughs> that would be even better, actually. Well, guess what? Guess who's like, only the good students show up in the very last day lecture, so I think you really deserve it. Unless there's traffic and you want to get one early. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's at least one that's not here right now. So, anybody have an example of crazy pointers? Yeah. Why not the a? Why not star 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 a equals equals uh, mm. equals. Mm. Like, can you just yeah? Just think it's equal to a t, and but there's there's the uh, there's the two. Let's see. What do we want? T equals malloc. Uh, let's see. I think we have to cast this and star star star. What do we want the size of? No, this would be a double pointer. Right? Because the triple pointer is going to point to something, and when we do reference that, it would be a double pointer. But aren't a double pointer and a triple pointer the same size? Yes, but do you want to make that assumption? Why wouldn't we? It does, could depend on different systems, could be different. You know, you want to do the thing that's correct, not the thing that just happens to be correct. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is actually, now we have to do a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, if you could just do like whatever the question was on the one that we <laughs> <laughs> But we've already done that midterm, right? It's not like well, we could do something like this. I think this would be fine. Term two. There wasn't any of Fox Rebel Diagram. Yeah, you just do the actual one from the two.
handwriting does not get better the thicker the pen gets. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't stand this. So ugly. It was under tools. Tools? But I don't think that, oh, format. Well, how do I format it? I feel like if you just hit a bunch of buttons, it'll work eventually, right? The left bracket, like the square bracket button, is like in Photoshop and stuff. Like that on features of the side, I don't know if it works. Oh, maybe that's what I did. Maybe I. Well, all right. We live and we learn. We survive. It's okay. We can understand. W, we have A, we're going to have B. We'll have C. We'll have D. W, X, Y, Z. Cool. Okay, so the first thing we have A is equal to malloc size of care star star star. So that means we have a new memory location. We know that in a malloc. That is going to be memory location one. Oh, come on. Right? So memory location one. And this means because malloc returns the the address, which is 1. So that will be copied into the value of the location associated with A. Wow, you guys thought we were done with all that precise semantic talk. So that is the number 1 inside there. Then B, oh, so then we have C is equal to malloc size of character star. So now we have C, so now we have a new thing of memory location 2. And so we will have 2 inside C. So pretty good. In D, we are saying D is equal to malloc size of character star. So now we have another one, memory location 3 is inside D. Good. Okay, next line. So now we know A star points here, C star points here, and D star points here. Right? Any questions so far? be the easy bit, right? See here, I don't even care that it's star, 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 right? All I know, those are just types that kind of help me make sure that I'm not making a mistake. So let's look here. So we have address star A is equal to the address of C. So on the right hand side we have the address of C. What's the address of C? Y. Y. So I take Y and I'm going to put it in what location? Which one is stored? Star A. So remember, star A refers to an L value. It returns to a location. So star A will refer to this box here. So I'm going to put Y here. Hmm? Oh. Yes. The address here into here. So now we have star A points here. Star, and then star star A will point now to here. Did this question ask us for aliases at the bottom? I can't remember. No, that was a different one. I think I separated them out. Yeah, so this is just drawing box circle diagrams at each of the locations. So at point one, so then we have, so we did this one, check. So we have star C is equal to D, Y. Well, I really can't, okay. Equal to D. So we have D. When we say star C, right? What is that? So what is star C? Yeah, this location here. And when we say this is equal to D, what does that mean we're doing? Take the value in the location associated with D, which is what? Three. And copy that into the location associated with star C. Good? All right, did this one? Now comes the fun part, right? So we'll draw it here. So we have star A. So we're adding star, 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 star A is equal to the character A. So we have one go star A. Another one is this is going to be star, star A. Right? This will be to two, two, 
3a, and then down here will be 4. So you also trust me that's 4. And so we're copying the character a into there. Good? So I think what tripped up most, well, some things I saw what tripped up people was this part here, this line. So they ended up overwriting this with A. I actually, had, I actually went through that like three times because I kept the, the double checking myself. So this is point one, snapshot. Good? Questions on that part? I mean, you don't have to take a picture on recording, but. OK. So it's now. It's kind of annoying on the exam because then you have to take this entire thing, copy it, and then start again to get the point two. It just took time, it seemed unnecessary. Just inside me, two sentences. I can see that. <laughs> Next slide. Allocating a new thing for. D is equal to that, so we have that here. We're going to put this into D. Now we have another new memory location, 5. Setting that into B, so B now contains the value 5. OK, so we say the address of D is equal to star B. So where does B point to? This 5 right here. So that, this is where we will put the value. So what's the address of D? Two. Z. 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 <laughs> Clearly. All right. Now we say star D is equal to the character D. So we dereference D. We're here in four. Questions? All right. I'm going to figure out this pen. It's like trying to take a test with a Sharpie. Yeah? I had another question, uh, similar to Larry's. Uh, for those of us who are on the fence about continuing academia or moving into the industry, um, being that you've done both and you had a pretty damn good job at Microsoft, what was your motivation to moving back into academia? Good question. So it kind of depends on what you want to do. So I basically did the equivalent of the 4 plus 1 at, uh, at Santa Barbara. So that, and some of the students here are in the master's program, although they may just be starting, so they could probably give you some tips. Um, basically, the way I see it, the master's, so during undergrad, you kind of get a base level of education, right? And then you get to kind of specialize in areas when you take electives, but those are still base. Right? You don't go really far into depth. When you start taking grad classes as a master's student, you go right up to the current state of the art in research in that area. So you get to choose different areas to really drill down into. So for instance, the way I like to think of it is when you guys took architecture, like computer architecture, uh, you learned about MIPS machines, in theory. And, and you were taught. <laughs> in, in theory. All right. Uh, you were, you were, you sh got exposed to MIPS machines and the MIPS arch architecture and how MIPS pipelining works, all that stuff, right? Uh, when, you take, when I took grad architecture, the professor put a picture of a P4 die on the screen and was like, you'll be able to tell me what all the different parts are on this die and what they do. And so we read research papers starting in the 80s up till the current day about how they design processors, all the different types of cache prediction, we learned that like real CPUs don't actually execute your assembly code, like x86. They translate it down into microcode and execute that microcode, and they can play all these kind of tricks about reordering your execution, uh, your instructions, if they can prove that they can do that, and it'll make things faster. Real things have pipelines of like 20 stages. Um, anyway, so you get to learn the actual complexity, and you get to choose the areas, so it's an areas that you're really interested in. So for me, I saw masters, especially if you can do four plus one, for me, that was a really good time benefit trade-off. So I got to go in depth, and I only spent an extra year of my time. Um, so I really enjoyed that. So, But PhD is completely different. 
So masters is more of what you're used to. Masters is more of taking classes. So then to bring you back to why I went back to Microsoft. So uh, at Santa Barbara, we have three options for our masters. You can do thesis, like you can do here. You can do exam, which is similar to the MCS. There's an option in the middle that's a project. So I did a project and I was working with the person who ended up being my PhD advisor. And basically we did a research project. So uh, this was the study on black box vulnerability scanners. So I created a, a website with known vulnerabilities. I got a bunch of scanners, I tested them, analyzed the results, wrote everything up. Um, anyways, so we submitted that paper, I think in June to a conference right when I was graduating. And then, like three or four months later, we found out it had been rejected from that conference. And so, uh, and this is academic life. You do cool research and you submit to conferences with anywhere from 30 to a 10% acceptance rate. And so, you know, not everything can get in. So, um, paper got rejected once, we submitted it again, it got rejected twice. And then I was, let's see, on the bus home. Where was I? Yeah, I remember I was on the bus home, so I was living in downtown Seattle, working in Redmond, taking the bus home, reading this paper for what literally felt like the 30th or 40th time. And as I was reading it, it kind of hit me like, oh, wow, nobody's ever done this before. Like, this, this thing that I did is something that fundamentally nobody's ever done. And at Microsoft, I was solving problems. So I really like solving problems. Like, give me a problem, let's think of cool ways to solve it, algorithms, data structures, whatever. And so I enjoyed it, I enjoyed my job, but I wasn't, I realized I wasn't doing anything new. I was building another app. People have built apps for a long time, right? Uh, but when I looked at the research, I was like, literally what makes it research is the fact that nobody's done it before. And that really appealed to me. So then I contacted my advisor, asked him about going back and went through the process and made the decision and pulled the trigger. Oh God. Please don't know, that's true. <laughs> Any class related questions first? <laughs> to yeah. to kind of change gears, will we need to be able to do and fully understand how to beta reduce a lambda expression designed around an arithmetic operation on church's numerals? Quite possibly. I have it passed in and be able to go through all the steps. Yeah, so you need to be able to beta reduce lambda expressions, right? So I could give you any lambda expression. You're gonna provide us like the church's numerals. And yes, the if you need any of the definitions, I will provide them to you, absolutely. Yeah. Can you go over a beta reduction? I can't hear you. Can you go over a beta reduction? Sure. I think so. <coughs> can somebody uh, give me one? on so much stuff. This is in here. Okay. What are we doing? I'm oh, sorry, I just need to get a lambda character. <laughs> cool. Alright, we probably start with this. So what do you want? You came up with you asked. You gotta come up with the example. I got one. Alright. Uh, lambda A, dot lambda B, dot lambda C, dot B, flat bracket, uh, A, B, C, close, and then close the whole thing. So, can we do a beta reduction? Will you give it to us reduced? Like, like instead of writing out like true, would you just write T or something on the test? Like instead of writing out the definition for true, it could be like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I think.
think I'll still go with what I said. If, if you need any of the definitions, I will give them to you. So, are there any beta reductions? Yes, so we have one beta reduction. So we have an application. The left-hand side of the application is an abstraction. So we're going to take the body here, and we'll go pretty slow on this. So we have lambda b dot, am I doing this backwards? That's weird. Lambda b dot lambda c dot b a b c. And this whole thing, we are replacing a, substituting, substituting thank you. Lambda x dot lambda y dot x y. Right? Yes. Cool. So let's think about ways I can make this faster. Are there any free variables in this? No. 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 So do I have to worry then about doing any renaming operation while I'm doing this? No. No. Cool. So then I can actually just look in here. I mean, I could. Parse, you know, I can keep applying my rules and doing the substitution further and further, but what does the substitution mean? Replacing A with Putting what? Replacing A with equivalent. Replacing all free A's? Free A's. All, free A's. all the free A's, yes. So I know I don't have to do any renaming operations if this doesn't have any free variables. Since it doesn't, I know I will never have to worry about that. So what I can do, I can look in here and replace all three A's with this expression. How is that making it faster? Is that just the algorithm? Like that's what you go That's the semantics. If you, I'm saying if you were to do this step by step, you do lambda b dot uh, lambda c dot b a b c. And you would say substitute this a with lambda x dot lambda y dot x y. And then you'd apply the rule again, you'd get to an application, you'd apply it to the left and the right, and you'd keep going through until you finally got to the A and replace that. So we will eventually, so dot, 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 lambda C dot B. So now here comes the important part, right? Do I, so I know I'm replacing A with this, so do I do this? What's the problem here? Well, it looks like there's a problem. There is a problem. Oh, well, the thing you substituted was its own. Yes! Video. The thing we substituted needs to be its own lambda expression. Right? We can't change the way we parse this ABC. It should still parse as, well, we know the first thing is going to happen first, so it should be application AB and then application the results of that with C. Because if, if we did it like that, then we'd be done. There's no more beta reduction yeah. to do. Well, there's this whole thing, right? The problem is this body here. Yeah. Exactly. This bo is all the body of this abstraction. Mm -hmm. So we've essentially, ch we've not only changed the original expression, we've changed what we substituted in, right? We were only supposed to substitute in lambda x dot lambda y dot x y. That's a self-contained thing. Right? But now we've changed its body to say lambda x dot lambda y dot x y b c. So we need to be really careful when we do this substitution. And one way to do that is when you're replacing this complex expression, wherever you have a, put parentheses around it. Done. Cool. Now, am I done? No. So what do I have to do? Yeah, so I have an application here where the left side is a lambda expression. So now I'm going to do lambda b dot uh, lambda c dot b. And so I'm going to take this inside here. So then I'm going to say lambda y dot x y replacing b, no, replacing x with b. And the reason that we're not replacing it with b c is because our disambiguations say that we start at the left Yes. We would replace it with BC if these were groups like this. Yes. If we don't write the like if we don't write this step and we just go ahead and write lambda y dot by c and we we don't do the step where we write out the substitution, is that fine to show our work? If it's done correctly, yes. Okay. I mean you 
showing you less work, right? So there's a couple ways you can do this. You can just jot down the answer. That's fine. I come up with the answer, write it down. But if that's wrong, then it's completely wrong, right? There's no, it's hard to get partial credit for that. Um, you know, the more steps you show, the more partial credit we can give you for seeing, hey, this was a mistake here, but after that was all correct. Okay. So in here, so now we do have a free B in here. Do we have any meta variables or anything that's going to clash in here? No. no. No, so we don't have to worry about that. So we can just replace this X with B. So we will have lambda B dot lambda C dot B. We will have, what are we going to have? Lambda Y dot B Y. Apply to C. Are we done? No. Nope. We still got one more. We have an application here, lambda expression on the left. So we will substitute this Y for this C. Right? Inside here, we will replace, we will substitute this C, this Y with C, sorry, Y with C. takes two parameters and just returns them, right? So lambda x dot x is an ID. This is like lambda, is this is a, a function that takes in two parameters and just returns them in the same order. You could have a cool one where you take lambda x dot lambda y and switch them, so you could swap the arguments. Was that a good example? And we're done now. Yes, so do we have more beta reductions here? Why not? Yeah, can you explain what <coughs> if it's What are the <coughs> when do we have beta reductions? There's an apply application. There's an application and what's the condition? The left hand side is an abstraction. The left hand side is an abstraction. So this is an this is an abstraction. We had X, Y, Z here at the end. These will all be in the body because of our disambiguation. So, we did exactly. break, yeah. so we'd have to add parentheses like this for us to do another step. And then we have three applications here. No, that would be kind of function. We'll, we'll have what? Well, we do one, and then we see what happens, and then we do the next one. Yeah, but we have three possible. Like, if, if there were three like, lambdas, you could essentially replace X with the first lambda, Y with the second, Z with the second. Yes, that's what will happen. You said 1.3? Yeah. Hmm. You chose the easy one? <coughs> cool. How many combinations of plus can I font bigger? There we go. We have lambda x dot x, 
lambda x dot y dot y, lambda y dot lambda x dot y. So like <laughs> what is this? That's false. Isn't it? it is false. We just like what is this one? True. This is true? Yeah. What is this one? Substitute that in there. Oop, there. So we have false, false, true. What's that guy right there? So that would be definitely one way to do this, right? If you can use these identities, right? It doesn't matter what, what the names of these are. They could be X's, Y's, A's, and B's. As long as they are different, and this one always returns the second one, you know that's a false, and you know the behavior of that, right? That, that's uh, alpha equivalent? Yes, they're alpha equivalent. Yes, what did but you get from FFT to P? Because it has the second FFT. False, always returns the second argument. So you're applying false to the inputs, false and true, which always returns the Yes, this is okay. the, wait, what is this? Yeah. This is not a function, I think. This right here. It's taking the input in. If it's true, return the first one, which is false. <laughs> if it's false, return the second one, which is true. So this is the same thing as what we've done in class of not false. Yes? Um, so in general, like if, we, if we had to err on one side or the other, do you, do you recommend spending more time just like getting the base uh, steps down cold or spend more time trying to get a feel for these higher level constructs and recognizing them and using those? No, I would, I would focus on the basics because you don't need to know that for this. You can just do this substitution. So if I can do it you know, a little bit, I can do it a little bit quicker if I'm copying and pasting here just for kind of oops, uh, lack, you know, to save some time. Oh man, it's almost 240. If I were to do that in here, <coughs> So I do have an application in here. So here I do have a choice, right? I could do this application in here. I could do the outside one. It won't matter which one I choose, right? So what do you guys want to do? The outside. Yeah. Well, we already did the outside, so let's do the inside. We lost. <laughs> so then I will basically replicate this whole thing, and I will take this. I know it's a combinator. It doesn't refer to anything else. Those are the things I think you should you know, remember and focus on. OK, this doesn't refer to anything. So then I can take that, and in here, I can replace x in here with that. Well, there's nothing in there. So that goes away, right? Are there, so can I do this application? Can I beta reduce this application? No. No, because it's an application, but the left is not a lambda. It's not, sorry, whoa. the left is not an abstraction. Yes. So now in here, I replace x with this. So we cannot reduce this foo and bar. So definitely, I made a mistake. Yeah, I thought that whole left hand yes. thing is Because this hard. is how we parse this, right? Yeah. Yes. So this is not, there is no beta reduction is in here. This is the bodies of each of these abstractions. 
This is the body of this abstraction. Okay. Yeah, that's a great call. Yeah, I was looking ahead and going, oh no, we've, we're getting the wrong answer. Did I lie all those weeks ago? <laughs> okay, there's only one way we can do this. We replace, we take this body, and inside here, we're going to replace all three x's with this combinator. So this is another important thing. Just make sure you know down cold, looking at this expression, what are the free x's? Right? There are many x's here. Only one of them is free, this one. Right? Now I get to a case where now I have to do this one first. So again, just in the same thing, these are grouped first. This has to happen first. So uh, we, to, to do with that, on the last midterm, are the in the in the case where we were circling things and underlining things? Yes. Are the is this variable, that's a good question? Is this a free variable? No. Is it a bound variable? Yeah. Sort of. No. Is it a variable? Yes. yes. It's a bound variable. See, I asked Moses about this in recitation, and like, well, no, because I what I initially did was that it says underline bound variables and circle the free ones, right? The free ones are easy. So I underlined the bound ones, and then I did arrows pointing to the lambda to which it was bound to. Yes. And then I asked you about it, and you gave me this look, yes. uh, like maybe you were really stupid. So then I went and I underlined them all. Because I was like, is it okay to do the arrows and not underline them? Like, so did you ask that during the test? Yeah, I did. I oh, I think I just told you I can't give you any information. But it looks like you're everyone. Okay, well, I don't know. But it's just... <laughs> Maybe you misinterpreted I, my look. <laughs> well, yeah, but but the, the point is, before the exam, we didn't, we didn't get into the minutia of... Because it's a variable because we call it a meta variable. Yeah, that's why I underlined it. And... It's, we assume that if the bound variables are bound to it, then it's also bound to the bound variables, and there's this symbiotic, like, <laughs> symbiotic <laughs> relationship. The arrow that you would draw two way or one way? Well, but, I would so say I it's a one way arrow, right? I underline so. both of them. So if we have the lambda x of x, I underline both of them for the test. Because I, and I asked most about it, he's like, well, but that lambda x is not a variable. It's a meta variable. Is, yeah. It's a meta variable. So in a, in class, we did an exercise with the free, var free variables and circling them, but we never did an actual distinct example with underlining specifically bound variables. And so I think there was a little level of like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it, for didn't, certain it didn't years. come up at all. So I was, that's why I was hoping to get the tests back, because if that came back and I got really crappy points on that, I was going to be like, well, but. Well, yeah. know that everyone will be graded the same. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no curve. Yeah, so there might be. Term, there might be. The midterm you had free variable, and then mm -hmm. now it's like a different context of free variable for this Why? time. Because I thought a free variable, like that outside lambda on the very okay. x. Where? Here? Right? No. Where? Top. There? What is that? The lambda x. Yes. On that same line. Yeah. Yes. I found x would not be free because of that lambda x. Oh, but yeah. But we're like erasing lambda context. x. Context, exactly, yes. So the questions on the midterm are in this lambda expression. What is a free variable? Right? When we're doing substitution, we're saying in the body of this abstraction, so thinking of this body as just one lambda expression, what is the free x in there? Right? So just considering this on its own, x the free x is on the left. Just looking at that, like I could ask you, I don't know. Like every time you do the you the Okay. Yeah, so it'd be like asking you something in here, like if there was, well, that's not a bad example. I don't know. So yes. clarify, don't underline the lambda x dot x. Correct, right. those are meta variables. The dot x is bound, the lambda x is nothing. Yes. No, it's not nothing, it's a meta variable, right? But it's nothing in the case of of free and bound, yes. It is neither free nor bound because it is a meta variable. And it's also not a variable. Can we get partial credit for that? Because to be fair, it didn't say underline all bound variables. It didn't say don't underline anything else. Are you going to underline the entire thing? That's like That's why I was wrong that I did that beta reduction. 
this innervator reduction. You cannot do this. You have to do this one first, and you can't do that. Right? This is exactly the same thing as this. I was talking about the next step. Oh, the next step? So the next step here, exactly the same thing. Well, similar thing, right? By associativity, this thing happens first. So if you think about it, looking at this as an expression, so we have an application here with a lambda, sorry, with an abstraction on the right and an application on the left. So we cannot beta reduce this because the left side is an application, not an abstraction. Right, that whole thing. Three variables, bound variables, these are meta variables. They are not variables. Okay, that's why I just want to make sure make clear that the thing is Do we need to expect to be able to compute first and follow sets for this exam? Like is that realistically is that a question? Everything is fair game. Yes. So if you were asked first and follow, would we be given the steps for first and follow? Kind of similar to the first answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what are you supposed to write in that? Or can you just write that in it's ambiguous and No, you should have been able to write it because the non-terminal was ambiguous for was not the one we asked you to write. Technically you told us whenever you have to write it faster, you have to check whether it's ambiguous or not. So if it's ambiguous, then don't write the faster. I agree. It was a mistake, but it didn't affect the actual writing of those problems. Right. The intent is not to check you on that because we've had other problems to check for ambiguous grammars, right? This was writing the parser, so the focus was parser writing. Yeah. How long do you have? How long is the final? Yeah, an hour and fifty minutes. How long were your midterms? Fifty minutes. It's like an hour difference. I'm not going to answer questions about what's on or the length of the midterm. Those are all. Can you give us the answers to the midterm? No. Next question. I did already give you all the answers to the midterms. Final. Yeah. Yes. Did anybody already ask if you have an estimate on when we'll get our class midterms back? Uh, I am pushing for it, yeah. Hopefully soon. They're 80% graded. Seven? When's that going to be? What? Homework seven, right? Oh, the grades? Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I have to check on that. I didn't realize they were posted. Email me. I can check. Anything else? Two more minutes. Yes. In two min? Two minutes? Yeah. Very cool. hard. In which one? Midterm two? Midterm two. No, it was midterm two because we had an extra one on midterm. It was midterm two, midterm two. If we're going to get uh, an exemplar on the test, is it going to give us the equation and the parse tree? Or do we have to draw the parse tree this time? Uh, it'd be like all the exams you would be given a parse tree. Yeah. So like this? So we have, I'm going to number every node in the tree, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <coughs> so I have variables, I have F, A, B, C, then I have one, two, three, four, five, Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So these are all the things I need to know types for. Right? Cool. So I know from this definition, I know that f is a function that takes in some type t1. Well, do I do ta? Yeah. Type ta, type tb, type tc. We actually don't have a class after here, so we can say. 
Yay. And returns what? Type of T1, whatever this node returns. Right? Uh, I can, yeah, you could do this, but I think A, B, and C, I mean, this is, so I would write here T A. I'd write here T B. I'd write here T C, just like here I'd write T1. Okay, so then we look at node 1, so I have to go top to bottom. So we have node 1 is type 1. We have an addition. What does this constraint give us about our direct children? 2 and 3 have to be the same as what? It. What? No, not int. We don't know anything about ints yet, right? All we're looking at is this node and these two children. So the key is they're all the same, right? Not only do the children have to be the same, but they have to be. They have to be the same as the parent. Right? So this means type node 2 must have type T1. And node 3 must have type T1. Right? Cool. What? Exactly. This is how you have to tackle these problems. You can't look ahead to try to think about what the type is going to be. We're going to get there and we will propagate that type. Yes, you can also do bottom up. That's totally fine. I just like, for whatever reason, I don't know. It just makes more sense to me to go top down. Okay. So then we'll go to two since two is the next node. So two is an addition. So what does that mean about it and its children? Two, four, and five are the same. Yes. So that means four and five are also T1. Yes. Exactly. Now we go to node three. And now what is node three? What is the type of node three? It has to be an int. So in order to satisfy that, what does the type of node three have to be? It has to be an int, which means T1 has to be an int, right? T1 is super broad. T1 means it could literally be any type. But we know that's not true. We know it has to actually be an int, right? So we have go from this super general type now to an incredibly specific type of int. So now we go through our thing and we replace all t1s with ints. Right? Just like in your project 4, when you saw that actually these two types are the same, you can get rid of them and change all of one type to the other type. Right? All of your variables are now this int type. Yes. Everything that was a t1 is now an int. Okay, we just did 3. Now we're going to use it 4. So what's the type of this node? Wait. No, what is the type of this node? C. It's C. What's the type of C? TC. TC. But we also know that node 4 has to be what? An int. So we have really general type, very specific type. What's the type have to be? Specific. Specific type. It's got to be, so TC is now int. So everywhere, I'm going to get rid of all the TCs, and I'm going to put int. Maybe. On the final, as we're doing this, will there be a possibility of a type mismatch? I don't know if I can answer that. Okay, then we go to five, and we look at node five, what is this? What's this apply? What does that mean? In general, what is it? This is addition. It's a function, it's a function what? Call, yes, this is a function definition, this is a function call, right? So it's a function call, so what does that mean about the relationship between it and its children? that this node here means that 6 must be a function 
that takes in T7 and returns 5, which is an int. Right? And right now we don't know anything about T7, we just know it's 7. Cool. Now we look at 6. What is 6? An array access. So what does that mean? Has to take in an int. Well, the right must turn over an integer. Yes, the right is the index operation. So this is an index operation. We're indexing into an array. On the left is the array. On the right is an int. So that means T9 has to be an int. Is this an array of type 6? Or is there a type of So now what does this mean about int? It's an array of type 5. Note 8 is what? Array of 6. Yeah. So node 8 is an array of, what is node 6? Functions. Cool. So we just did 6, now we visit 7. So we see that 7 is type A. So what's type? So we see type A here. So now we know type 7 and type A are the same type. So everywhere we see type 7, we're going to erase it and put type A. Yes. You can do it the other way. As long as it's the same. Yes. Because we're saying they're unconstrained. We don't know what A has to be. We just know that node, we just know that the type of A has to be the same as the type of this node 7. That's all we know. Right? So up in some places we're using the type of node 7. Now we need to make sure we're using that in the same place. So we can just call the type of A now as type 7. It doesn't matter as long as they're all the same. Cool. Okay, just at 7. We look at 8. So what's the type of 8? To B, it's TB, right? The type of B. So we say it's the type of B, but we say that node 8, we already know that node 8 is an array of functions that take in TA and return an int. So between B, TB, and arrays of TA return an int, what's the most specific type of those two? The second one, right? TB could be anything, right? TB can be arrays, functions, integers, strings, whatever, no constraints. But this is a constraint. This says the type of node 8 has to be an array. Right? That is smaller. And not just any type of array. It has to be an array, an array of functions. And those functions must take in a TA and return an int. So I'm harping on this because that is, um, so you know that that's more specific. So that's the one you want to go with. That's your constraint. Right? So you say type B must be an array of TA goes to int. Is it a? Type mismatch of a function it takes in itself. Like if, if it was an array of functions that take in its own type, is that evaluated for mismatch? Yes. Yes, so no more TVs. We replace. Only because I'm lazy and don't want to write that again. Don't do this. You don't have pencils that are four times as thick as your lines. <laughs> At least I hope not. Don't take an exam like this. This would be insane. Okay, we visit node 8, then we visit node 9. What does node 9 say? An integer. An integer. So we, what's the type of C? An int. So we have an int and an int. Those are the same thing. They're the same amount of specific. We've gone all the way through. So now these are our types. So we know on here, we'd say the type of A is what? A. A. T A. Type of B? Array of functions that take in T A and returns int. The type of C, int. What does F return? Strings. <laughs> yes. So when we 
we say what type is that for term? Should you write this whole thing? Uh, yes. 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 Because it's a function that takes in all that junk and returns. But it's returning. It's you just return type. Type, type that f returns. Well, it's inconsistent though, because half the time you ask for what is the type of f, and then the other half you ask for what is. You can't read it for exactly what it's asking you for. <laughs> but it's on the other exam, so the third midterm, right? Did it ask for the type of f? Uh, yes, because I realized that it was ridiculous because you're rewriting text A, B, and C when writing the type of F. So I changed that on future midterms or exams, I think, to, for the type of F. So we're going to expect to write the type of F? I expect you to read the question. <laughs> 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 The important thing is it has to be the same here, right? If they're not the same, then you did something wrong, right? Just a quick question. All right. So why did we go to an industry after your PhD and work in a research lab rather than working here? You could have. You're saying I should leave and go to the industry? <laughs> just, just to. I'm kidding. Um, it for me it was more uh, an opportunity thing, so. Uh, it's, it's easy to leave academia and go into industry, especially nowadays and especially in security because oh, yeah. everybody's interested in security. Um, they all, you know, everybody has problems. Um, would yeah, you make they, more money that way? I would make a lot more money that way, yes. <laughs> uh, but I love you guys, so. Um, but the flip side is more difficult. If you go into industry, Right? So you get a professor job because you can do research, you can teach, and you can bring in grants and work with students, right? Part of that is your publications. So when you go into industry, you publish a lot less, if at all, because your employer, depending on where you work with, may not value publications as much as actually doing research stuff. But you are directly interacting with the user. Your thing is going uh, interacting with the users. Right? Yes. So I'm just saying it's, it's happened. I've seen it happen. Professors go into industry and then go into academia. It's harder, though. So for me, it was, hey, I should go. You know, this is the time in my life. I just got my PhD. I should figure, I should see if I can do professoring and be a professor. And then, you know. So is this better or is this that better? Mm, completely different jobs, like insanely different. Like, uh, I, so at an industrial research lab, I would be doing more of the research myself, like coding and doing all that stuff. Um, as a professor, and some of my PhD students are in this class, I don't, I get to do very, very little actual coding and research. I'm more of a manager and say like, hey, these are what I think are really interesting problems and I try to help the students work through their problems, but fundamentally, the PhD students do the research. My job is to really go to National Science Foundation, government agencies, the military, the Navy, and try to get money to fund the students. So my job is to get the money to fund the students. The university takes about half of all the money I get as overhead. Um, and so, yeah, so that funds my research, so that funds the students, and I'm also expected to teach and serve on program committees. So I review probably, oh God, I don't wanna count, um, probably 30 to 40, maybe 50 papers a year uh, that are submitted to conferences. I have to read them, write reviews decide if they should be accepted or not. So yeah, it's just it's just different jobs. Like I have a lot more different things I work on, but it's cool because I get to be involved in web security research, mobile security research, forensics, low level trust zone research, all kinds of stuff. And if I was in industry, I would be very much time like focused on one thing. Yeah. So so yes. So we've done actually a lot of work. Um, one of the big things we've done is we've, uh, right before, uh, towards the end of my PhD, I developed a crawler to crawl uh, the Google Play Store and download Android apps. So we now have like 1.5 million Android apps and we actually just bought this really sweet uh, for you server. So it's like this deep, this big, and it can hold 45 hard drives. Um, and so we got 13 four terabyte hard drives to start with because we want to re so this is, we've got 1.5 million 
distinct APK ID apps. And so we want to go through, but those are from 2012 up till now. So we want to go through and download all new versions and be continuously downloading versions of apps so we can see how apps change over time. Uh, but yeah, we've done static analysis work to identify vulnerable uh, Android apps. There's so many ways that developers can mess up how they're doing uh, mobile development and that impacts you, the user, and you'll never know it. So we want to develop tools to find them and to let developers know that they're being insecure and how to do it securely. Yeah. What's your long-term plans for storing those apps? Are you just going to keep it indefinitely or? Yep. Oh, that's good. You can actually set up an artifact for that. Yeah, it should be fun. I, actually, my, well, my long, long-term plan is uh, we're going to try to do like an open app analysis platform so that other people can run analyses, static or dynamic, on our apps. And then when they publish those results, They'll get kind of like a DOI tag, like a unique identifier that links to the exact data set of apps they ran against. So that follow-up research can improve on it and run against those exact same apps so we can do fair comparisons of future research. So that's kind of long-term goals of that. Yeah. Okay, if you get like, is that between 545 next semester? Mm -hmm. If you get the, the link for the website, or I guess next semester's website up, could you post like on that site like some of the topics that we should be really familiar with? If you send me an email, I'll be much more likely to do it than if I just say yes now. Okay. Oh, my videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 545 videos are on YouTube. I don't, I, I'll have to dig up if there's like a good condensed version. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think my slides are pretty good on networking. We kind of walk you through it, but like a deeper understanding is always better. Like networking is the big thing, so. Yes. Oh, that's like right. I saw that. You can get a huge pile of variety of books covering what you just asked for. I, I, don't, I don't need to, I didn't catch the first half of that. Humblebundle.com. Humble bundle? Here, I can open it up. Oh, although, is this going to open up everything? Humble bundle. Digital copy of all these books, which could be a great reference when you're looking up. I promise. 